Good morning. Thanks, Tim, and especially for your leadership of Second Nature and your creativity, drive, and commitment to help higher education partner with, the, with other sectors to deal with the existential climate crisis. Um, Second Nature and later, you know, starting about a quarter century ago, Second Nature and later AISHI, the National Council for Sustainability and the, and the Environment, the Intentional Endowments Network, and others were created for a sole purpose. And that was, that was and is to help higher education fulfill its purpose of maintaining and renewing civilization. As we all know, modern civilization could not exist without higher education, and we are the key to its future. Unfortunately, humanity continues to be on an unhealthy, inequitable, and unsustainable path on a finite planet with a rapidly expanding population and material needs and desires. Higher education is critical to the rapid change in mindset, knowledge, and exemplary action for, for, the, for the path uh, to sustainability. Thank you to all of you for the, your unprecedented leadership in helping to make this transformation, especially in this current political climate, as Tim in indicated, and especially the 500 or more institutions that have committed to be becoming carbon neutral uh, build resilient communities and transforming education. When we embarked on, the, on, the, on this mission at Second Nature uh, in 1993, my colleagues and I began to explore how, to got, how we got to this place as a species and what principles and strategies would allow us to survive and thrive. I was fortunate to read a seminal book in 1993, The Ecology of Commerce, which helped put in, in bold relief how commerce and sustainability were antithetical by design, but not intention, and laid out a set of principles for a just and sustainable economy. I was intrigued because it was written by a brilliant, successful entre entrepreneurial businessman named Paul Hawken. He quickly became one of the most important leaders in helping business understand that they must provide for social well-being and preservation of the life support system in order to survive. I quickly sought him out and was able to persuade him to join the board of directors of Second Nature in the 1990s. That began a journey with him and many others, a number of whom are with us today, to understand and utilize the deep strategic sustainability principles that are embodied in many of the elegant ideas uh, that we embrace today. For example, natural capitalism, the triple bottom line, the natural step, and other frameworks. Uh, uh, and I had the pleasure of working with Paul to bring the natural step to the United States, which we did successfully in the late 1990s. As you can see from his bio, he has continued to have a major impact on business and civil society as a thought leader, author of eight books, an incredibly sought after speaker, a consultant to heads of state and to major corporations, and an entrepreneur. In many ways, he is the father of the corporate social responsibility efforts of the last three decades. Now he has embarked on his most ambitious task, dealing with the climate crisis, a stark but not the only example of humanity living out of sync with our life support system to our own peril. As he has done in all his previous work, in Project Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming, Paul and his colleagues have developed a surprising, and it's, you, they will be surprising, trust, trust me, set of solutions that go well beyond conventional thinking and will help solve some of the broadest health, social justice, economic, and ecological challenges we face. Paul, you may not realize what our partnership involving the natural step did for second nature. George and Michelle Dyer, my important partners when we launched the Climate Leadership Commitment in 2007, joined me after graduate studies at the Blekinge Institute in Sweden, which was designed after the natural step that was developed by Carl Henrik Robert. So thank you for that, Paul, and for being one of my most important mentors, a good friend, for your clarity and drive in helping society see the possibilities for long-term survival, and sharing your ideas with us here at the Climate Leadership today. Thank you.
<laughs> thank you, Tony. Thank you, Eric and uh, <clears throat> Tim, too. Thank you all for an intentional endowment network, Second Nature. Thank you, Danielle, who is the house mama here, where she, she puts it, makes this all happen. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for coming today. So early in the morning, I was um, woke up early, and it sounded like on the third floor, like the Le Mans racetrack from my room. I don't know about yours, but <laughs> that was time to time to get up anyway. <laughs> uh, yes. Tony said to tell the people here that they have three by five cards on your table for questions. So um, uh, now you know. <laughs> um, Drawdown um, <clears throat> is a work uh, that started really in my mind in 2001. And in 2001, the third uh, assessment came out. Third, uh, uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment came out, and I think those who follow climate follow each assessment, and no one reads the whole thing. You read the summary. <laughs> um, uh, and I read it in 2001, and it was more pessimistic than the second, which is more pessimistic than the first, which is in no small part due to the fact that it's a consensus report. And as you know, there's many scientists here. There's no such thing as scientific consensus. Science is evidentiary. <laughs> And um, so the consensus is due to Venezuela, Russia, China, and Saudi Arabia, which means that everything was tamped down. And so you had to parse it and read between the lines. And um, at that time, <clears throat> uh, with all due respect to the Carbon Mitigation Project, um, nevertheless, it came out that year, the, the famous global wedges. Uh, and the glo eight global wedges were adopted, could stabilize emissions by 2050. And they were comprised of 15 solutions. And of those 15 solutions, 11 of them could only be adopted by the boards of directors of large, very large multinational corporations, uh, eight of which had to be energy uh, utilities, one energy, one car, and one appliance company. And every one of those solutions is underwater financially, which meant that the solutions to our fate depended on the very conservative boards of directors of large corporations basically breaching their fiduciary responsibility and spending down their balance sheet. And I thought, I am not so optimistic. People are reading this and going, oh, wow, we have a solution. I think, no, we don't. And it was at that time I started to ask people, friends, really, do we have a list? Where do we stand? Do we know what to do? Can they scale? What do we have at hand? Are we really capable of doing this, addressing it? And furthermore, at that time and to this day, I was very concerned about the language, which I'll talk about more um, uh, later into the presentation, but the language then, and as is now, was about stabilization or reduction or mitigation. These are the words you hear. These are the nouns you hear with respect to climate. And I dare say that I, don't th I think the people who started to use mitigation probably meant militate. Mitigation means to reduce the pain and seriousness of something. And I thought, well, I, that doesn't sound very appetizing to me um, about climate change. And furthermore, I wanted to name the goal. So I started to talk about drawdown in 19, uh, excuse me, in 2001. You know. And uh, I went to NGOs, I went to institutions, big NGOs, and said, let's do this, let's map, model, and measure the largest solutions to reversing global warming, they all looked at me a little bit bug-eyed and going, really? And, but we don't do that. We don't have the expertise. Why don't you do it? And I said, well, I certainly don't have it either. And I did that for two years, sort of like Diogenes, you know, looking for a wise NGO. And um, not to say that there aren't, but just like nobody wanted to do it. And I forgot about it until 2013. And in 2013, Bill McKibben published in Rolling Stone, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. I think some of you may have read that, and it was aptly titled. And what Bill McKibben did at that time was take um, <clears throat> uh, Mark Campanale's work at Carbon Tracker in London. And Carbon Tracker, basically, Mark analyzed as a prior, his prior career was a financial analyst, and he analyzed the balance sheets of all the large uh, coal, gas, and oil companies in the world and uh, their reserves, that is, their assets, which was uh, the coal, gas, and oil in the ground, 
and basically said this is unburnable carbon. If we burn it, we're Venus, so it's kind of, why is it an asset? Why does it have value? We won't even be here to burn it uh, if we do. And um, Bill McKibben burned it, so to speak, in the article. And I had people come to me saying, it's game over. They're just, they're, these are activists. These are not just activists who've been very effective with respect to climate and the environment and just said, it's over, we're finished, we did it, we tried, it didn't work, you know, we failed. And it occurred to me at that time that sometimes in a, in a psychological sense, when we give up, you know, we've screwed up or <laughs> done something, but we, we surrender, There's a, we surrender. And when we surrender, actually, it, it's actually game on. In other words, the game over is actually the beginning of game on. And um, that's when I got together and created Project Radam and uh, with a small uh, amount of, uh, negligible amount of money and, and just a small number of people. And drawdown refers to that first time on a year-to-year -year basis where greenhouse gases peak and go down. And from my point of view, and I hope for everybody's point of view, that has to be our goal. It's the only goal that makes sense for humanity. Any other goal seems sort of limp-wristed or underwhelming. I mean, come on. Why do we want to mitigate something that is so serious as this? You can't mitigate it. And there is no stability where we are now, much less where greenhouse gases are going in the next 30 years. So this idea of stabilization, there is no stabilization in the weather. Weather is not a linear system. So I want to show you this next slide. This is the Greenland North Emian Ice Research Station, which I had the privilege of going to in 2009. And I show it to you because there's scientists from 12 countries that basically go there for 90 days of the year because it's too dangerous before and after. You can't even get in. Um, and what they do is they drill down uh, through the two miles. They finish. Uh, this is 2009. They completed it. But they drill down two miles through the uh, ice sheet uh, to bedrock. And what they're studying is the Emian period which uh, occurred 20, 125,000 years ago, um, at which time the temperature on the Earth was 1 to 2 C higher than, than pre-industrial age. In other words, the 1 C is what we are right now. And in different parts of the Earth, there's 1 to 2 C higher. This is um, what it's like in the summer. <laughs> and um, I, I show this because I, I know you share this, but the, the when I hear people criticizing science, climate science, climate scientists, you know, uh, it just um, is astonishing and appalling. Um, these people all over the world are doing basic research, core research, extraordinary research, um, under circumstances, in this case and many other cases, of uh, extreme danger. The person who is the go-to guy here who told you what to do, what to wear, what not to do, so forth, and whiteouts. Um, basically, 10 days before we got there had been caught out in a whiteout and is now a double amputee. And, and so um, what they do there, and you can see, is um, drill. And they, they go down. This is the um, result. This is the ice cores. And they can take a sort of a caliper, which is really an anode cathode. They go right down the ice core and they can detect exactly the amount of CO2, sulfates, uh, pollen as well, and get a very, very good uh, sense of what the atmospheric conditions were at that time. And then they um, benchmark they, with their colleagues in Antarctica. So they can tell if sulfate levels are high, they're not high in Antarctica, then that means there was a northern hemispheric volcano that occurred, or bi-hemispheric or southern. Extraordinary how much we know about the past. And the, the, the reason I show this is because this is a, um, uh, you may have seen this in different forms. This shows CO2 levels for the last 400,000 uh, years. And that dotted line is uh, 300 ppm. And our genus Homo, whether it's Erectus or Sapiens or Floridiensis or whatever, uh, has never existed on this planet for uh, 2 million years over 300 ppm until 1939. And so we're in Terra Nova. We don't really know where we are anymore in that sense. And what you see um, is the uh, current level. Uh, that current level is 407, depending on what month of the year, but it's about 407 ppm. But I think that 
what we don't hear is that this is the actual level of PPM right now. It's 490 PPM. Because 407 is Mauna Loa, it's Hawaii, it's fine, it's accurate measurement. This is including the other greenhouse gases and their uh, global warming potential, uh, methane, nitrous oxide, and HCFCs. We're at 490 now. So when you look at this and you have someone say, well, we want to mitigate, I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. If you're going over a cliff fast, you don't slow down and say, we're cool, no problem. You just Thelma and Louise in even slower motion. I mean, you're going right over the cliff. And so to me, when you name the goal, actually the possibilities and the innovation creativity expand. They don't shrink, they expand. Possibilities increase with a, high, a bigger goal. So drawdown is the bigger goal. It should have been the goal all along. Um, and stabilization, in a sense, auguries that. Say, so, well, if you stabilize, then maybe the next year it goes down. But stabilization is not a goal. That circle you see right there is the Eemian period, 125,000 years ago. And at that time, as I said, it was 1 to 2 C higher than pre-industrial levels in terms of the ambient Earth temperature. But the oceans were 10 to 20, feet, uh, 20 to 30 feet higher. Crocodiles were going up the British Columbia coast to breed in Alaska. There was hippopotamus in the Thames River Delta. There wasn't Kent and Sussex. They were wetlands. There were giraffes and lions romping over Germany and Denmark. And that was 1, 2 C, OK? And the causes are very different than Chevron and Exxon. But nevertheless, that is the result of just those deltas in temperature. And so um, this is how most of uh, humanity gets its information about climate change. And it's important to understand that because you're very well informed. You're within institutions and uh, NGOs that work on this. Literacy is your stock and trade, if you will. Um, education is about literacy. Uh, and what you see here is the headline is correct. And usually the headlines are based on some new uh, report that's come out from science, good science. But what you also see is uh, clickbait next to it about the woman who smashes her husband's head with a frog ornament and um, mummifies him for 18 years in plastic sheeting, you know, and somehow there's a, like an equivalency here. Well, wow, there goes the Tower Bridge, and, and, and by the way, wow, a mummified husband, and uh, which probably sounds interesting to some women, but, um, the, uh, but again, you see this again and again, and this is the, the headline is the Peter Bates study from Morgan State. It was, I don't agree with this study, but it was a good one. Um, but, and then you have 20 things you didn't know you could do with Coca-Cola, you know, and they're doing the right thing, of course, pouring it down the toilet, but, but I'm mean, just, <clears throat> I said that in Atlanta, and it was really inappropriate. <laughs> it's like, talk about, talk about insensitive, okay. Um, but again, this is, we see lots of these, we hear it, and, and all over the world, and, and then what happens? Well, if we're really concerned, then we Google, well, what can I do, you know? And if you Google anywhere in the world the top 10, 20, 40 solutions to global warming or climate change, you'll get this. You, you always get Scientific American Union Concerned Scientists. And you look at the lists on the left, and you might as well add love your mother. I mean, these are proverbs. Well, of course, be efficient, be smart, eat smart. Consul I mean, you know, yeah. They are solutions, but, you know, their behavior, and I dare you to do the first one, forego fossil fuels for uh, 24 hours. Just try it. It's interesting. And, um, and then on the third one, on the union of concerned scientists, you know, like you're, yeah, I should get a power strip for my home entertainment center. I don't have a home entertainment center. It's like this idea, and so unless, you have an, uh, unless you have an IQ lower than room temperature, I mean, you look at this list and you go, uh, this isn't inadequate to the task at hand. I get it, and thank you for sharing. But um, and what does an individual feel? So on one hand, on the headline level, they're getting their adrenal their adrenals just pumped. With, you know, basically, fight or flight is basically the methodology the media uses around climate. And then you take that into these solutions where you feel disempowered, you don't, I can't do it, I have a mortgage, my mom has Alzheimer's, the kids are uh, acting up. And I mean, you, you have a stressful life already and somebody says, by the way, you're responsible, here's what you can do, forego fossil fuels. And what you feel like is you just, you, you, you disengage, you go numb, you just go, I hope they do that. 
And the problem with climate communications is there are they's out there who imply that we are doing it. And with all due respect to a friend and a man who I have great respect for, you have Al Gore going over and over and again and again saying, solar, solar, wind, solar, solar, wind, Elon Musk. And if we do those three things, we have a hall pass to the 22nd century. And that's a scientific howler. Those are crucial solutions, EVs, solar, wind, absolutely, no question about it. But somehow, the three things that people could do nothing about except buy an EV or put a solar panel on the rooftop, somehow that that is going to solve the problem. What it does is, is they, the problem is they, it. it's they, they will do so. I hope they do it. And I'll do the best I can. And so it disenfranchises people, it disempowers them completely. And so we want to know at Project Radon, where do we stand? As I said, I wanted to know it in 2001, we still do. And so we created this organization and um, we didn't have any money and we didn't know how to do it. So was, other than that, we were good to go. And um, so we wanted this to be science-based, uh, of course. <laughs> and so we reached out to uh, educational institutions all over the world, the finest institutions, and posted up a job description for a drawdown fellow, research fellow. Um, and we were overwhelmed uh, with applicants. We had hundreds and hundreds of them. Aga Khan award winners, award winners, Fulbright scholars, Rhodes scholars, White House fellows, astonishing. Uh, 22 countries, six continents, almost half women, half PhDs, all double degrees, just the most amazing people. We've met uh, most of them now, not quite uh, in person. Uh, uh, and they did the core research in, in Drawdown, and they were joined by 128 uh, advisors, I think the number is a little lower right now, but, um, um, but uh, who commented on the content and made suggestions uh, and uh, on the data as well, depending on whether they're engineers or botanists or biologists or climatologists or politicians or business people. And then they were joined by 40 other uh, outside expert scientific reviewers from RMI, from uh, Next, Gen, Next Gen Climate, from Dan Lashoff at EDF and so forth, who basically reviewed our models. So basically we have about 200 people creating the data you see. Um, and what we did is we just did the math. That's all we did. We, we're, we didn't get fancy. Uh, and what you see in the book with content, of course, is you see these numbers. There's many, many, many more numbers generated by the models themselves. Um, but um, uh, the rank is by the number of gigatons, either of CO2 or CO2 equivalent, uh, avoided uh, over 30 years or sequestered. So what we did is all the solutions we modeled, and we map modeled and measured 100 substantive solutions, the most substantive solutions um, to reversing global warming, is um, we relied entirely on peer-reviewed data for the carbon or the greenhouse gas numbers, entirely. If there was a spread in the data, then we did um, sensitivity analysis for the median and we chose the low median number. And you do get a, quite a spread in land use, you do. You don't in solar and stuff, but you do in land use. Um, and, and so it shows the number of gigatons. What we did is every solution we modeled was scaling. So it's already scaling. It's not a question it should scale. It is scaling. And what we did is we continued to scale it for 30 years in a rigorous but reasonable way. Um, and that's that second figure, which is the number of gigatons that would be avoided or sequestered by 2050. Um, and the numbers are the same by 2050. The cost, in this case, negative because it's compared to uh, combined cycle gas or coal in applicable countries where geothermal is practical and it's cheaper than fossil fuels. And then you have the 30-year uh, profit, net profit or net loss uh, if you implement that solution, in this case, uh, it's a profit of $1.02 trillion. So that's the numbers you see in the, uh, sort of in the book. There, as I said, uh, dozens and dozens of more outcomes from the model. And I just want to give you a sense of the diversity of solutions. As Tony uh, mentioned, uh, it, the, it's surprising. The solutions surprised us. 
we started with 300 and we kept winnowing them down and doing back of the napkin and stuff. And then we had a bigger napkin and did more and more and pretty soon we were modeling. Um, and we were very surprised at the diversity, not the diversity, we knew they're diverse, but, but at, at how they ranked uh, and what their impact is um, and would be. Um, Aforestation is putting trees where there hasn't been trees before. So, or putting them in like in Iceland right now where they were cut down so long ago, people forget that it was forested. So that's aforestation. This high-speed rail, um, the Chinese and Japanese own this one and we're still fumbling around here in the US. This is one of the most important solutions. It's called indigenous people's land management. It's just supporting indigenous people on the lands which they uh, are, are still have been allowed to basically manage and control. Um, indigenous people have lost most of their land in the world. Um, but the, the important figure there isn't the top two, it's the bottom right one, which is really the amount of CO2 equivalent or CO2 actually that they are sitting on in biomass and underneath in the soil on those lands, which is greater than the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So that tells you something about <laughs> both the possibility, the protection needed, and um, the danger thereof. Improved rice cultivation, there's two ways to change it, which really go from an anaerobic to aerobic environment mid-crop. Um, mid um, each one of them produces methane uh, emissions by about 50%. Rice is a big emitter of methane and in increased productivity and actually decreased cost. So actually, they're kind of a no-brainer. It's just a matter of teaching, uh, 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 and that's why there's no cost to do it. It's just a, a oral teaching. Uh, this is uh, onshore wind, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, and you can see the bottom right number, 7.43 trillion. This is such a conservative number in terms of profitability. Um, um, and uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier today, I think to Ken Laughlin, but that there wasn't, um, so far, <laughs> I should uh, knock, knock, knock. So far, there has been one scientific gotcha or economic gotcha for Drada. In other words, not one scientist has come back and said, oh, you blew it. And the scientific community is the gotcha community, I can tell you that. And, um, and, and the reason I think there hasn't been is there has been criticism. The criticism has been, you're too low, you're too low, you're too low, which is exactly the criticism we wanted. Uh, we didn't want somebody saying, you're egging the pudding, you know, all that sort of stuff. This is offshore wind. And again, what, what I want to say about this is we often see pictures of wind turbines, you know, on a, a grassy hillock, you know, and there's children playing in the foreground with wildflowers and daisy chains, and there's this beautiful wind turbine, the blue sky. You go, oh my God, that's the future. That's a terrible place to put a wind turbine. Um, this is where you want to put them, where the, where the weather's really pissy and awful. And this is in North, North Shore, in Sheringham and Norfolk and the North Sea. Um, and uh, it's not photoshopped, that's a triathlete. Um, and this one is an older woman, Lake Titicaca. She lives on a straw uh, home in a straw island. Uh, she has been lighting up that straw home at night so her girls could do their homework with a kerosene lamp. <laughs> and now she has a solar panel. She's not grinning because she's doing her part for climate change. She's grinning because she's doing her part to be a good mother. And I think this really underlines something that you'll see in the 100 solutions, except for one, really, maybe two. They're all no regret solutions, which are these are things we should be doing regardless of whether there's a climate scientist alive and we were clueless as to what was causing extreme weather. We would want to do these things because they have so many benefits to humanity in terms of clean water, health, employment, prosperity. I mean, it just goes right on down the list. Um, and so the idea that somehow that if we adopt these things, if we do it, um, um, that it's a cost is, is uh, diabolically ignorant. By the way, we do have one of my advisors here, Dennis Carlsberg from Boston. I just, there's Dennis, I'm, I'm so sorry. For, we have one of our advisors right here. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so this is rooftop solar. And again, what you see with rooftop solar, let's pick on Atlanta again, is you see these drone shots of three car garages in Atlanta suburbs, you know, with, you know, with a 10 uh, kilowatt array. And this is renewable materialism. This is not what we're talking about going forward in the future. <laughs> And, and the rooftop solar has such a big impact on the lives of people all over the world. This is women smallholders. Why is it here? Hmm. 
Well, first of all, all about 24 5% of the food in the world is produced by big ag. And I don't know about you, but since I've, all my life, I've been told unless we adopt big ag, industrial ag, we're going to starve. Because I started the organic food movement very much so in this country when I was 19 years old. And everybody said, oh, you're going to starve. You're going to, you know, you, it's a, you know, poor children. <laughs> it was just guilt tripping, you know. I already was raised a Catholic. It was bad enough. And then, and then we had, you know, people just ragging on us about organic food, you know. And, um, but women are 40% of the small holders, which produces 70 plus percent of the food in the world. And uh, 40 times 70 is 28%. Do the math. Women produce more food in the world than big A. Who knew? <laughs> Why is it here? It's here because they don't get the support that men get in terms of seeds, tools, uh, training. And if they do, they outproduce men. Mm. And if they do that, you have a big change in avoided deforestation. So that's what we're modeling, which is let's support women on the land. And, and what happens, it has a huge environmental impact, which affects climate. Um, this is the, the Carmody bear, the great bear forest in British Columbia. Again, it's forest protection. Uh, this was uh, uh, populated by indigenous people, of course, uh, not so much now. The, the Hadagrai there and others. But, but I mean, uh, the figure in the bottom, 896.2. Uh, gigatons, again, more carbon there than is in the atmosphere. Um, uh, this is a plant-rich diet. <laughs> and uh, it's number four solution. What it really is, is not telling you to be a vegan vegetarian, which you certainly may. It's not about making a food choice for you. It's saying, well, let's reduce the protein intake uh, where we're over-consuming here in the United States for sure. We're about 100, 110 grams. We should be at 50, 55 to be healthy ourselves and to raise that amount of protein in those countries where it, it, there's malnourishment. And, um, but you do that and you substitute a, a, a reasonable amount of your protein intake to seeds and legumes and pulses and so forth, and you get uh, basically the number four solution to reversing global warming. Um, and uh, this is regenerative agriculture. Basically, it means many things, but it means stop plowing, stop disking, stop breaking the soil. I mean, of course, it means other things, and it combines with organic agriculture, but um, uh, the amount of carbon that's released in the soil in the springtime in the northern hemisphere is mind-boggling. Why? Because people are plowing the soil, you know. Um, this is the number three solution. Forty. 45% of the food in the United States is wasted, thrown away. It's produced, it's farmed, it's packaged, it's distributed, and then it's thrown away. And it's thrown away in restaurants, homes, and put in refrigerators where basically food goes to die in this country. And um, in poor countries, it's the opposite, which is this loss uh, uh, at the farm or the supply chain, the cold, they don't have cold chains, etc. Uh, poor people don't waste food. We do. Um, and it's a huge impact. This does not measure methanogenesis. It does not measure what happens to that food when it's placed in landfills and becomes anaerobic, and you get methane generation, which is 28 to 34 times more powerful uh, as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, if it did, it would be uh, even rank higher. This is household recycling. A Dasanak woman in Ethiopia. We want to get imagery in the book and to, to try to not show a blue bin. <laughs> like, it's just boring. And so this uh, woman and her uh, sisters go across the bridge uh, where uh, she is in Ethiopia, and they built a bar there for the men who are building the bridge, and they go there in the morning to take, get all the things the men have thrown away, you know, the SIM cards and wristbands and mostly beer bottle caps, of course and they make jewelry and headdresses. They all wear it, and they sell it to boutiques in France, and that's um, household recycling. Um, and then we have 20 coming attractions, and we have a book coming on D2, which is 60 more, and these are solutions that are scientifically valid, which are not, uh, which are incipient. They're just there on the horizon. There isn't the peer-reviewed data. There are not the economic data, so we can't model them, but we can talk about it. 
And, um, and the reason I wanted to put them in there is because I wanted to give people a sense that humanity is on the case. Um, to, in other words, we're not asleep at the switch. It, it, we, can't, we can't let the media, or particularly the Beltway, think, uh, be a mirror to us and think that's what's going on and that's what people think and that's who we are. It's not true. And humanity is ingenious, it's brilliant, it's extraordinary in its capacity to invent and to reimagine what it means to be a human being right now, given what we know. This is marine pomoculture invented by um, Dr. Brian Van Herzen, a plasma physicist, who was flying over the Greenland ice sheet for a friend, a glaciologist, and who was counting milk ponds. And as he flew over in 2001 and 2002 and three and four and five and six, he, he noticed that the ponds became lakes and the lakes became very l big lakes and rivers. He could see on a year-to-year -year basis how quickly the Greenland ice sheet was melting. And from that, he decided to change his whole career. He worked with Pixar and Google, he was making lots of money, and he stopped everything and invented this marine permaculture. 99% of the uh, tropical oceans are marine deserts. There's, there's no life in them at all. Right? And what's happening in the oceans, 93% of the heat from global warming is being absorbed in the oceans. And it's creating these thermal blankets. And these thermal blankets are preventing basically the natural thermoclines and current cycles to occur. They're being suppressed by the heat. What marine permaculture does is put in frames and they're just frameworks for, as you can see, for kelp, algae, uh, uh, <clears throat> phytoplankton, etc. And not phytoplankton, but the, uh, uh, the area for phytoplankton. And these are PET frames, recycled PET, that don't break down in salt water. And there are these tubes that go down to the thermocline, 200, 300 feet down, these cold, nutrient-laden waters that are there. And the actuation of these things is by the rise and fall of the water, and it brings the water up in these tubes and then spreads it out into these frames. And with, this is what you see within three, four weeks, literally. I've done it again and again. And you see phytoplankton, zooplankton. You see algae. You see kelp. Nothing sequesters CO2 faster on Earth than kelp by the way, number one, over bamboo, everything. And you see feeder fish and forage fish. In other words, you get this, you get this trophic cascade of, of life is what oceans do. Oceans will regenerate so quickly. They did one in Hawaii within six weeks. You had whale sharks swimming around it. And, and so what it does is it takes out the carbonic acid. It deacidifies, obviously, then the water. It uh, reverses coral bleaching. It produces uh, protein for fisheries, for fisher folk. Um, and um, it really it costs something to put in. But once it's in, um, it is just like you know sinking cars and you know down people drop cars in the water and they produce these beautiful fisheries. You know, uh, th these do the same thing, but in a much more intelligent way. Th this has a could have a tremendous impact uh, in terms of global warming. This is repopulating the mammoth steppe, also the Arctic Circle. Um, basically, the animals were extirpated by us 12,000 years ago, most likely for food because it got cold, and uh, and pretty much. You know, the musk ox and the wolf and the bison and the ones that were uh, endemic to those areas uh, all were wiped out completely. It's about bringing back these animals to the Arctic Circle. And why? Because during the winter, and this is also um, uh, the reindeer, which you see, which are still there to a lesser degree, because in the winter, when they're, it's dark and they're hungry, they brush away the snow with their hoofs or their snout or their uh, horns, and it reduces the temperature of the soil by 2 degrees Celsius, which is a permafrost protection plan. So again, these are two biologists in Russia, the Zimovs, father and son, again, creating what they call the Pleistocene Park, and in a sense to bring back life, to regenerate not only life there, but actually to provide a buffer and resilience to us. This is building with wood, um, and there's a 90-story building going up in London, built entirely of wood now. The 30-story building already exists. Uh, these buildings are safe as, as steel and concrete, safer in some ways. 
Um, uh, these, uh, the, the CLTs, the laminated glue, the beams do not burn. They char, but they don't burn um, in a fire. Um, and they sequester carbon. And now you're seeing this beginning of carbon architecture, which is really how do we, how do we build buildings? How do we build cities that actually also sequester carbon as opposed to emit it or even so-called carbon neutral? I mean, how do you build a city in the future in a way that we bring carbon back home? And you do it by combining afforestation with using that wood in this way to uh, uh, build uh, buildings. This is the last one. A cow walks onto a beach. Um, um, when I see this picture, there's many titles I could think of, but this is the one I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is about a, a, a farmer in Prince Edward Island who discovered or noticed that his dairy cattle eating kelp produced more milk. And from that observation, one thing led to another. He asked a county agent who did not know why. And he, he asked a scientist, Rob Fairley, who thought he knew why. And he basically felt that uh, somehow the kelp uh, must be interfering with methane production because methane is a very inefficient metabolic process in ruminants. As you know, um, uh, cattle, uh, dairy cows and cattle produce 11% of human emissions, uh, um, anthropogenic emissions. Well, they're not anthropogenic, but we're the ones who put them in CAFOs, so we are responsible. And, um, and so what they did was, um, uh, separate the herd, fed some kelp, some not, put bags over the head five times a day to measure exhalations, and sure enough, there was a reduction in methane production. Um, but so what? Because who's going to feed kelp to cows? <laughs> and except on Prince Edward Island. And he got in touch with a scientist in Queensland who was doing the same work, and they to together discovered an algae called Asparagopsis taxiformis, which fed as a 2% supplement to uh, sheep, cows, and goats, or ruminants, reduces methane production by 70 to 90 percent. And uh, it's just a huge impact. And th there's so much work going on in this in Stanford and all over. Uh, and the, the, the tricky thing is really about uh, keeping it vital uh, when it's dried. Uh, and so, I mean, there's some problems to work out here. Um, but it's an extraordinary solution. What surprised us, and Tony mentioned this, you know, surprised. We were so surprised. I would have said exactly the same as Al Gore, wind, solar, EVs. I would have done the same thing, you know. Of course, renewable energy is responsible for only 1%, right? There's only 1% of our energy in the world, not counting hydro. But carbon, fossil fuel energy, is responsible for 60 plus to 70% of our emissions. So it's just like obvious that we should get rid of it. Of course, we should. But that isn't necessarily the path back. And what surprised us was that food as a sector was the number one sector. And we know food and transport are the two top sectors in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the reason food is larger is because um, it is a huge source of emissions. But if you change methods of agriculture and land use, it can sequester carbon. So it's a twofer. It can go both ways. You stop emitting and you sequester. Uh, so it has a huge impact. Um, and if you combine that with land use, you can see, again, why is transport then there on the right-hand corner so small if we shift to EVs? It's because we have to go, when we model, against the business-as-usual scenarios of the IPCC, of the World Bank, of the IEA. And basically, they're predicting there'll be 2 billion vehicles uh, in the next 20 years instead of 1 billion, which they are today. And so we may not agree with that as an organization, but all our data, all our data comes from either science on the economic side and on the business as usual side. It came from the most respected international institutions in the world. So what you see in Drawdown isn't stuff that we know. If a small NGO in Sausalito, California said, hey, look at, look, you know, listen up, this is what we know, we'd have all the credibility of a lentil, you know, and, uh, and like, it just wouldn't mean much. And, and we knew that, and so that's why the data points and the inputs came from the rest of the world. And so what Drawdown is, is a we, 200 people, going back to the bigger we, you and everyone else, saying, this is what we know. We know this already, and we are doing this. Everything we model there is scaling. 
So this is a very different approach. We don't even say we're right. We just say we're trying to be a really good mirror to the world and that we did good math. In other words, in a way, our, uh, we're, we're, we're the opposite of people who, you know, white charismatic male vertebrates who say, I have a plan, I know what to do, listen to me, follow, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. We have a white charismatic male vertebrate in charge and look what's happening. This is not a good idea, you know. And, and we don't need that anymore. We got here because of charismatic white male vertebrates. Let's, think, let's look at this a little differently. And so it's really important for us that you understand that this is a reflection back to the world, what it knows. The top solution is refrigerant management. Refrigerants are, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand times more powerful than CO2. Uh, energy, if you combine off and off, off and onshore wind, would be the number one solution, not refrigerant management. But at the same time, um, this little cutie pie uh, in Kenya is the number six solution. It's educating girls. And educating girls is the... Uh, there's a thousand reasons that we should do that, and one had nothing to do with climate. But we were modeling it, the impact on climate. And basically, when a girl is yanked out of school when she's at or, or, or at puberty f to either go to work to put her brother through school or to basically early marriage, um, she has a very different life. Her ch choices are made for her uh, as as to who she becomes as a woman. She has five plus children. Her children don't do well. She doesn't have the education or the economic resources. So her children do not. Health outcomes are problematic, always. Poverty, basically, is a vicious cycle. If she's allowed to matriculate to what we call high school, she has two plus children. She becomes a woman more or, uh, on her terms, if not completely, and she makes very different life choices. It's a form of family planning, but the family planning comes by empowering that girl to become a woman on her terms as opposed to being imposed upon her. You combine that with, well, family planning, <laughs> which is clinics everywhere in the world to support women's reproductive well-being, health and choices and so forth, and you put those two together and six and seven and add them up, it's the number one solution basically to global warming. Okay, I mean, who would have thought? Again, it's who knew? And this is why, again, it's like, why don't we know that? The whole book is full of who knows. This is not us trying to advocate and say, you know, this is what we think is true. We just did the math. And um, we don't have much time, but you can see in the back of the book different scenarios. One plausible, which is if we just scale it the way it's scaling now, we do not achieve drawdown in 2050. You tweak them you know, increase it, accelerate them, you've achieved drawdown in 2050, and you optimum scenario, which is you tweak them a little bit more, and you get drawdown in 2045. And this is what the solutions look like in a pie chart, and I just want to say, we tend to go to the big solutions, say that's what we should do. All solutions are important. It's the system that caused it. It's the system that heals it. And the book, The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed, when that was suggested to me by my publisher, I said, no, 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 it's so brash, and, you know, I just, I didn't like it at all. And I left it on my desk, you know, it's actually the verso for the back of the book, it wasn't even the subtitle. And I realized it is the most comprehensive plan ever proposed, because no one's ever proposed one. <laughs> and it's the first plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. So as an English major, I kept thinking, well, it's the most nuanced, the most brilliant, the most colorful, the most, you know, uh, but we chose comprehensive. Um, and it's not our plan. And, and this is really important. It's not our plan. We think when the, uh, all said and done, when we mapped and measured and modeled this stuff, that we think humanity does have a plan. And it's not top down. It doesn't come from the politics. I'm sorry. It doesn't come from COP 21, 22, 23, 24. It doesn't come from elected national leaders. And that's not to say there's not a lot that they can do to accelerate, and, and of course, but it's the middle out. It's not even bottom up. It's the middle out, which is humanity does have a plan, and it can't see it because what we get on our face all the time is basically how we're screwing up or how things are getting worse faster. Did you know? And that's the next thing. Oh, it's not, it's not bad. It's worse, you know, than you thought. Did you know? Haha. Uh -huh. It's like, I mean, that is the messaging we're getting. And while that's very valid in terms of science, no question, 
the, the, the communication of the science has been inept. So the science is extraordinary. The most amazing uh, uh, work humanity has ever done on a single subject is the IPCC, extraordinary. Two and a half billion data points, and what is it doing, basically? It's scaring the pee out of people everywhere, and 99.9% .9 of the world is disengaged about climate change. How about that? How could that be? It's about the way we're talking about it. And um, the way we're talking about it is not helpful. I'm just going to skip on this one because of time. You can ask me later. But I do want to just finish with language. And, and again, what I'm just saying about how we're languaging it, I realize that's not a verb. But nevertheless, we are talking about it in ways which basically objectify the atmosphere. We're talking about fighting it, combating it, a climate crusade. What an unfortunate uh, a historical term that is. I mean, does, you know, I mean, I mean, the the battle, slashing, curbing. That's what you do to dogs in Manhattan. You curb them. You do not curb climate change. It's like the carbon war room, negative emissions, which is about sequestration, bringing carbon back home. Is called a negative emission. I, again, I'm an English major. There is no such thing as a negative emission. Those are self-canceling phrases. Decarbonization, give me a break. We did it. That's the name of the problem. We decarbonize the earth and put it in the atmosphere. That is not the solution. It's recarbonization. Bring it back home. And, and again, does, I mean, there's, does every woman in this room knows what it feels like to be objectified. That's what we're doing. What is objectification? It's like, it's like assuming that something is other. It's other. It's a disconnect. And so all these terms are about looking at the atmosphere as if it's a problem, as if you could reverse climate change. You cannot reverse climate change. You can't reverse any change whatsoever, ever. And the climate is supposed to change. It's a blessing. It's extraordinary. Wow. What we can do is reverse global warming by changing what we do here on Earth. But this rhetoric, this way of talking about it, again, is guaranteed to disengage. And then finally, you have the piece de resistance, which is 2C. OK, science-based target, right? Check again. That's Nordhaus in 75 at Yale, an economist, and Joachim Schellenhuber, 1994 in Germany, a scientist. Both of them say they pulled it out of thin air. It is not science-based. It may be right. I'm not saying it's not correct. I'm not saying it's good, not good to have a target. But this idea that it's science-based, I'm sorry. There is no science on this. It's guess. But. The problem with it is it's a future existential threat. It's out there somewhere. And when it happens, it's like, wow, you don't want to cross that threshold because what? All oh, hell's going to break loose, or we'll never be able to get back, or no one knows. It's like the bogeyman, right? So we, don't, that's our, we can't go past it. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Is it human being, the human brain is not wired to respond to future existential threat. Those people in the past who responded to it and thought about it a lot are not in the gene pool. They are not your ancestors. The ones who are here, the human beings who are here, responded to current existential threat. That's who we are. And so for us to presume or to think that somehow if we beat it in to humanity, that it's going to wake up someday and say, shoot, yeah, that's really bad. Let's do something. It's not going to happen. This is the ineptitude of how the science, which is brilliant, is being communicated to humanity. And what do we respond to? We respond to human needs. What we need to do if we're going to reverse global warming is to respond to human needs and address them. We are the only species without full employment. Think about that. There's 10 million other species. We're the only one who marginalizes itself and says, you have no value. We don't need you. See ya. And then we build an industrial prison complex to put it in and make money 
off of the marginalization of our fellow human beings. You know, brilliant. How's that working for us? And never has there been so much work that's needed to be done, good work. And what human beings need is security. They need work. They need meaningful, dignified, living wage work that makes them feel that they have value in this world. That's what people need. And that's what we need to do. So the pathway to reversing global warming is to address human needs now, not to tell everybody they have to put aside or sacrifice or think about the long term. The long term, it will be solved if we address the short term, which is what humans need now. And we can do that. There's two ways to generate economic activity. There's the degenerative development, which is what we do now, which is to steal the future and sell it in the present and call it GDP and pat ourselves on the back, put it in tax shelters, concentrate that wealth, and figure out new ways we can steal the future uh, with our capital. Or we can have regenerative development. And regenerative development is healing the future and selling it in the present and calling that GDP. We can do either way. That's our choice. That is the difference between reversing global warming and going right over the cliff. When we treat the atmosphere and climate as other, which is what we're doing, basically, it's dual mind. That is the disease. That is the problem. We other people, other races, other gen gender, not other genders, but I mean just other gender, other, I mean, that is what we see is riddled in our, our politics right now is seeing humanity and religions and cultures as other. And that, that is the thinking that God is here. It cannot solve it. It's the problem itself. You know? So it's really about coming together. And, and, and I just... Maybe I'll show this last slide. I know I'm over it, but this is Mark Watney. And the Andy Weir book on the Martian, this is what it's from, is actually a metaphor for what we're doing on Earth because basically he's in Mars. He, built, he has an atmosphere. He's making potatoes, growing it in his poop, <laughs> which is a little gross, but nevertheless, uh, he's in a closed system. We're in a closed system. Basically, he blows his atmosphere, right? Blows up. He's got to get out of there. He comes back, and he's talking to one of the astronauts, and what is, what is, what's going on? He's... You know, I mean, they're all looking at him as the hero came back. He's got gray hair, a little bit of gray hair. And he said, uh, basically, he said, pay attention because this could save your life. When I was up there, did I think I was going to die? Yes, absolutely. Space does not cooperate. And that's where we are, you know. Atmosphere does not cooperate. It does not cooperate. It's just being the atmosphere, right? We can fight it all day long, not listening. And so I said, listen up, because it's absolutely going to happen to you. Some point up when you're up there, you think this is it. This is, wh this is where I end, you know. And he said, you can either accept that or you can go to work and you do the math and you solve one problem and you solve another problem. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. And basically, that's what reversing global warming is about. It's about coming home. It's about solving one problem and the next one and the next one. We have the best problem statement humanity has ever created in the science. Let's stop rubbing our noses in the science and the problem. And what we need to do is work on the solutions. And we know how to do it. And that's really what the drawdown message is, that humanity is actually extraordinary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Yes, questions. What, what, what am I supposed to do now? Uh, there's microphones, and there's three by five cards, and there's people. And, <laughs> and I love questions. But. All right, first question okay. is over here. Um, hi, I'm uh, Keith Johnson, um, one of the um, 
IEN steering committee members. And thank you so much for uh, giving us these insights. It's just incredibly important. Um, one of the things I was curious about is if you know whether Hold there, closer to your mouth. Do, do you know whether there are any academics and um, others that are working on sort of a second book about what are the opportunities for building and creating the next uh, generation's wave of billionaires by implementing these things and bringing together um, both the academics that have worked on this project, chief investment officers from the academics um, foundations and endowments, and um, teaching organizations for the investment community like the CFA Institute. Is there anything to look at the uh, investment opportunities that you're being considered? Uh, yes. Um, so what's happened, the book came out April 18th, so it's just about nine months old. So uh, what's happened so far, there's 11 universities that are now going to be partners with Drawdown, and they will have the model. Uh, they're going to uh, work with us. Uh, we're a collaboration uh, to, cla to, to basically curate the model. Uh, those models will be available to everybody in the university or maybe even outside, but to download, to amend, to modify, to play with, to most importantly to localize and regionalize the model. Because it's a global model, not very useful if you're trying to figure out what's going on in Belgium. And so uh, those universities include Penn State, uh, Georgia Tech, MIT, um, uh, University of Washington, Northwestern, um, the 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 UC the couple in the UC system um, and um, and ANU in Canberra uh, Imperial College in London Terry in Hyderabad in India um, and we think that's just we have a new university every two weeks now or one I mean it's just it's just growing and growing um, and that's what we want the model everywhere so people can make it better and make it more nuanced make it more particular to a place to get to your Backwards, we're working with a Danish inventor who's produced strat producing stratospheric airships that will be stationary at 65,000 feet that have sensors that can read uh, emissions from the land down to GPS coordinates of a fence line. And we're, we're going to marry that data with the models so that, uh, that if you regionalize the model, you use it to benchmark and understand what are we doing, what can we do, are we, are we progressing? But to measure that with real time, um, uh, data about actually what's happening on the ground. In other words, so right now we're in an airplane going through fog with no instrumentation. We are clueless as to what's happening, actually. We don't have any idea where we're going, what's happening, who's doing what, uh, and whether it's working. We really do not. And, and so by, by combining these two together, then you can localize in a way that's meaningful to a state, a province, a country, an island, uh, which, the, uh, which people need in order to act. A system without feedback isn't a very good system. It, in fact, it dies, it perishes. So this is about creating feedback models and so forth, both up, up from the ground and down from the sky and so forth. In terms of coalitions, w what we found is that Drawdown creates self-organizing systems. There's Drawdown Toronto, Drawdown Nova Scotia, Drawdown New Zealand that's just starting. Um, we have a, 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 the DINA, the German Energy Agency, starting a Drawdown Europe, which is a hub, a center for education. Um, we have uh, a, a Drawdown Funders a, a network, a, a fund network, excuse me, which is impact investors, uh, family funds, endowments, uh, philanthropists who are coming together to share and understand what to do with this data in terms of risk assessment, in terms of investment, in terms of what they want to do. There's a $500 million uh, private equity drawdown fund being created right now. Its first placement of capital is in Q1 of this year. Um, there is faith-based coalitions. There is a curriculum group gathering all over. There's already curriculum down to fourth grade, <laughs> really. Drawdown is so cute. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and uh, but right through uh, colleges. So uh, we're working with Vulcan Productions in Seattle to create NGSS a curriculum standard. Uh, <clears throat> material. Uh, Vulcan's producing short form videos for, uh, for the curriculum and also for social media. There's a Netflix TV series uh, on Drawdown, which is really stories about people. Um, there is a documentary happening. There is um, uh, uh, an urban group 
uh, urban cities are coming together to be drawdown cities. Um, and all this is happening without us doing it. This is the, this is the important point I want to make. And where we are is how can we help, but not, we're not managing it. We're not dictating it. We're not telling people what they should or shouldn't do. We are not giving out a PowerPoint presentation saying, learn this and give it. Uh, we are giving away anything we have to anybody. It's all transparent. It's all open source. Uh, we own nothing. Um, and basically what we're finding is that people are responding. Because basically what the, 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 the news, the information is coming from you know, climate reality and so forth is about the probability of what's going to go wrong and how soon when, and therefore you should do something, which is true. And we are all about possibility, given the problem, okay, what are the possibilities? And so people respond to possibility. Um, it's why the book was the, the, the best-selling environmental book in 2017 in the U.S., the best-selling climate book uh, for 25 years. Um, it it in, goes into 11 countries this year, uh, 72 countries, but actually 11 languages. Um, and I feel like it's, I, I'm not patting ourselves on the back, I'm patting every, all of us, uh, I am, ourselves, all of us on the back, because really what humanity has been waiting for is to figure out, to, to your question, what, what do I do? How do I do it? What's, you know, what, how is it going to work? We work with Google X in terms of new technologies. We have um, a second edition coming out in 2019. It would be out this year, except no publisher wants to publish into these midterm elections. They just say it's death. So 2019. Uh, and then finally, we have a book coming out called Regeneration, which is about regenerative development. And it's really these solutions don't exist uh, in isolation. They're actually a part of a process. And 80% of people will live in the cities by 2050. So it's regeneration with a very, very strong emphasis on uh, urbanization, uh, which is where actually human beings have the lowest footprint is in a city, not in the country. And um, so we want to really uh, 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 bring that out in terms of the subtitle to the regeneration book is how to create one billion jobs. So, because um, we think, to me, the, 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 my motto is let there be jobs. Let there be jobs. People want to work at something that's meaningful and, and they're not being able to. And so that's what that's about. So yeah, it's, there's a lot going on, yeah. Paul, yes, Ken Lachlan, Hi, Impact Ken. Asset Manager. Good to see you again. Yeah, uh, I see you, Ken. 30 years in this space, this is the most important thing I've come across. Thank you so much for the work and the Thank team. You. With all the wonderful synergies you were describing, uh, what's, from your perspective, what's the thing that you feel is most important that the second, uh, all, the, all the development from Second Nature, all the other groups, but particularly the work that you're doing inside of Project Drawdown, the Drawdown team itself, where must you be focusing at this stage? Uh, interesting question. Uh, it's interesting, you know, this is uh, in terms of education, because when I proposed the book to my editor uh, at, at Penguin Random House, uh, my editor for 25, 30 years, and we've had like four bestsellers together, and so I, I was not like a schmump, you know, I mean, like, you know, I <laughs> he didn't want to publish the book, and neither did Penguin. And it was so interesting, and I thought, well, I'm going to publish it anyway, so. And it went on and on this way. And people say, oh, it's expensive, it's color, you know, it's 100% post-consumer waste, and nobody buys these books, and, uh, and we have to print 10,000 at a time, which is gonna end up in the warehouse, you know, being remaindered. And this went on and on. We just kept doing the work and, you know, starting to lay it out and so forth. And it was so interesting um, because uh, the salespeople on their own made a kind of pricey of the book and took it to schools, took it to colleges, universities. Penguin's the only publisher that calls in every university and college in North America, only one. I think it's because they bought everybody, I don't think. But, um, and they went to, they have a 16,000 uh, faculty uh, database uh, of people who teach things that relate to Drawdown, which is quite broad when you look at it. And they asked, they went to the, not all 16,000, but just, you know, when they said, what do you think of a book that's science-based solutions, you know, about solutions? And to a person, they said, please, please bring it on. We are dying for something that our students have had up to here on another book on problems and how it's getting worse faster. They don't want it. They have fed up. They want to know what to do. 
And I took that back to Penguin, and Penguin was still like the production people and this and their history. Climate books don't sell, which is certainly true. And, um, and it's finally Catherine Court, who's the publisher, which is the CEO, a lovely, amazing woman, my gosh. And she listened to all this in the final meeting. Um, everybody's going in and out about yes, no, no, maybe so. And she said, let me ask you one question. And, or may, I think she said, may I ask you one question? She's so polite. And uh, I said, yeah, of course, <laughs> he's the boss. And um, she said, if we don't publish this book, why are we here? Right. <laughs> Everybody's like, <clears throat> it was published. And it was a, a bestseller the first week, New York Times bestseller. You know, it's like everybody's vindicated. But, but what, do we, what we need is we need financial support for sure because we don't fit the climate narrative. There is a big foundation. You know this foundation. They have, they, they don't have, seven, they have eight figures. They give seven figures every year. They give. Uh, nine, uh, not seven, excuse me, nine figures. They, uh, one, two, three, four, five, yeah. I mean, uh, and uh, they're bigger than that, and they give in climate a huge amount of money every year. And so a friend of ours called him up and said, uh, do you know about Drawdown? said, yeah, it's on every desk in the foundation. He said, would you be interested in like, helping fund this? He said, no, nope, it's not in our program area. Seriously. And so this is what we found, is that the book doesn't really respond to the climate narrative. The narrative is the COP narrative, the Paris Agreement narrative. Uh, it's the Al Gore, Jim Henson, Bill McKibben, you know, sort of Christina Figueres, you know, narrative, you know, which is a fine narrative, nothing wrong with it. We don't conflict with that narrative. I'm just saying is it doesn't conform to it. And so that's one thing we need. But I think the most important thing that we really need to do is to um, basically have enough warm bodies to respond. Everything I mentioned to the first questioner, everything is in response. We didn't initiate one of those things. It's in response. And we are now in a take a number situation, which is somebody says, I, re the request, the inquiry, the suggestion, the proposal, the partnership, we're going, here, here's the number, you know. And it's like a deli at lunchtime, you know, so we'll get to you. And we, we, we just don't have enough support in order, in terms of warm bodies, to actually respond to the world. The world is just coming at us from every direction there is. In the governments, the Commonwealth of Nations, uh, government leaders, Macron in France. I mean, it's just uh, astonishing the, 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 the uptake or the, 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 what people want, you know, from it because they want to work towards solutions. Uh, and so, um, but mostly we really do want to get it out through the university system, college system, to young people everywhere in the world. And that's, I mean, and again, it's not us telling them what to do. It's like, here, it's all yours. See what you do with it, you know? And that's going to be so exciting from our, our point of view. Uh, we're just 200 people. Can you imagine 20,000 or 200,000 people having this, you know, and teaching it and understanding it and changing it and amending it and modifying it and localizing it and regionalizing it and, and, you know, and adding to it, you know, and so forth. So, I mean, just that alone, I mean, we could just hang up our track shoes and go home if it goes out into the world like spore, like fungi, you know. And really, drawdown is like spore, you know. And uh, we designed it that way, and it turned out that way. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you.